Hi, my name is Asha Burke. I'm a sophomore at the Miami Valley School, and this is my first video reflection for the Fromm Elective 2020. To begin this class, we started by talking about the most important relationships in our lives and what they mean to us. And on first instinct, the first thing I thought of was my relationships with other people, such as like the way I interact with my friends or my parents or my teachers or my peers. But as I started to reflect upon it a little bit more, I realized while those relationships have defined a large part of my character and who I am, they're not the most important factors in my life. Those aren't the relationships that define kind of who I am. The relationships that define who I am are more intrapersonal as opposed to interpersonal. It's the way I view success and failure, the way I see myself, the way I look at life and how I approach it. Those are the things that really define who I am. Immediate first thought was to think of other people, but our relationships with other people, while they'll define a large part of our character, I think a lot of it comes to how we approach everything else in the world. The way we interact with nature and ourselves, and like I said, success and failure, those sorts of things. So yeah. Next in class, we read a pamphlet and discussed the having versus being modes of living. The having mode is something where you see everything around you as you need it in your life. Like, it's something for you to obtain, whereas the being mode is kind of living in it. The primary example that we talked about was love and the having versus being modes of love. When you're in productive love, it's most people in their lives have love or they're in the having mode when it comes to love. They see a relationship as something they work for, they attain, and they keep. And that's why a lot of marriages, Fromm says, fall apart, is because you see your marriage or your relationship as something that is given, and so you stop working towards it, and you lose that kind of initial love. Whereas the being mode of love is more productive love, as defined as this. <laughs> I think part of the reason that most of our society is in the having mode of love is because we do live in a very like consumeristic based society. Everything is about obtaining. It's all about working to obtain. We forget about the being mode in general. That right brained type of consciousness has become very like malnourished. That's the wrong word to use. I'm forgetting the word, but I'll write it here. We read the knowing beyond a knowing packet and one of the most interesting things to me was the way that he, the writer defines a student-teacher relationship. He starts talking about how a teacher is really just a student who's farther along the path. And the teacher is not trying to like educate the student to the highest level of knowing. He says that knowledge is like a river. And really all you're doing is teaching the student how to ride the river and how to move with the current. And I think that's really interesting. I never approached knowledge in that way before. I guess I always kind of saw it in the having mode of things to relate back to earlier. Knowledge is something you obtain and you keep and then at some point it goes away if you don't practice it. If you see knowledge more as a river, it's more in like the being mindset and you don't, you're constantly learning and constantly knowing and you're never gonna reach a maximum. So why pressure yourself to try to always strive for that maximum, you know? Knowledge is not a bunch of checkpoints. Knowledge at times can feel so overwhelming if you don't have the teacher to kind of help guide you through the current. It's, you think about how much there is of everything and how much it's constantly coming at you. We're always being assaulted with knowledge. It's when we stop trying to grab onto every little piece of it that we can, we start to actually ride the river. Instead of trying to grab onto like, I don't know, fistfuls of river water, you swim. Next, we dis discuss Campbell's view of the human psyche or, and this is like the diagram of what it looks like. And I'm just gonna try to explain it as best I can. So this circle is the parameters of your experience. And that's kind of where you've been, what you know, or what you think you know, and you know, everything you've done. And then this is the line of consciousness. So this is what we know, this is what we can like experience. And then this is our subconscious. If we look into the subconscious, we find our self, which is a little dot right there. And we find the shadow, which is that are unique to you. So maybe like 
I mean, I guess trauma kind of falls in there, but also like your relationship with your parents or like how you were treated as a child or like where you lived or that kind of thing. Things that are unique to you and make you who you are. Everything else below the region of consciousness, all of this like white space here, that is all shared human like subconscious, I suppose. And Campbell thinks that's where a lot of like myths come from. So a lot of the times where our dreams come from and that's why we all have, and that's why there's a lot of shared dreams. Like, you know, your teeth falling out or running from a monster or falling or something like that. And then this little box right here is the ego. That's how we perceive things. It's the I, it's very centralized and it's not, not great for experiencing the world. Cause it, and it doesn't allow you to access as much as you can. The goal of learning about these types of things is to try to expand that box as much as you can and tap into the right brain consciousness, which is where that heart comes in. That's your right brain and how you view things through that. And